All right, well, thank you, everyone. Tonight, I have the reins again to uh, teach something, and what I wanted to talk about was something that when I was newer to the Bible Rightly Divided, helped me come to an understanding of the Bible Rightly Divided, and also bolstered my faith in the Bible as God's true words. And funny enough, that put me right in Mark chapter 16. So we're going to be taking a look at Mark chapter 16 tonight. But before we do, I would like to review the lesson that I taught on Sunday briefly. So Sunday's lesson was called God Said It, Let God Be True. We learned that God spoke, and last of all, to Paul, the apostle. And we learned in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God spoke at sundry times in diverse manners. We learned that last of all, Christ was seen of Paul. And in Ephesians chapter 3, turn there with me. I'd like to read what Paul testifies about his experience. Starting in verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Paul testifies that the information Christ gave to him is the manifold wisdom of God, the revelation of the fellowship of the mystery, the gospel according to the mystery. Now, we also learned that the devil speaks, and the devil speaks lies. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the devil says, Yea, hath God said. That is the lie of the devil, questioning God's word. Or we also read about how the devil quoted scripture to Jesus in the wilderness, tempting God. So just as review, go to Matthew chapter 4. Starting in verse 6, the devil, in verse 5, the devil taketh him, that's Jesus, up into the holy city and setteth him, Jesus, on a pinnacle of the temple. And the devil saith unto him, Jesus, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou Dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. So the devil's lie is to question whether or not God said what he did, or to take what God said and use it incorrectly. For example, you may have heard Christians asked the question, was Paul the apostle to the Gentiles? Was he an apostle at all? He was a really great missionary. <laughs> or you might have heard people ask, was he even given any new information, any revelation? What is the dispensation of the gospel of the grace of God? It's just the same thing that's been taught since the beginning, right? Or was Paul given a dispensation of the grace of God, the mystery of Christ, to fulfill God's words, as we read about in Ephesians chapter 3? God said it. Yes, that is what God said. Amen. Let God be true. Acknowledge the different things he said, even when it's hard to understand. 
So we talked about letting God be true, and rather than dismissing or twisting Scripture, we need to study so that we can understand. And you're familiar with 2 Timothy chapter 2.15, but let's read it again. In verse 15, Paul says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The reality of what God said when it comes down to you and the Bible is if you think there's a problem, it's not the Bible, it's you. Amen. You need to study. You need to try to understand it better because God's word doesn't have mistakes and it is complete. Which brings us to Mark chapter 16. Now, before we go on, I need to go ahead and be forthright with you. I have no degree in the science of ancient manuscripts. I am not a textual criti critic or expert in ancient languages. I am not some person that you even particularly should pay attention to. In fact, with everything I say here today, I'm not asking that you believe me. Don't believe me. Believe God. Amen. God said words, and what I'm trying to do is encourage you to believe those words. So, if your belief in the accuracy of Scripture lies in the expertise of a man, if you have confidence in the flesh, if you think that the most ancient of manuscripts and languages is what's going to unlock the truth, that somehow we don't have it, frankly, this lesson is not for you. Um, I'm interested in talking with and working with and being with people who want to believe come to the Bible, believing it, and wanting to learn more and grow together. Amen. So let's read Mark chapter 16. After all, this is what God said. And we're going to actually read the entire chapter. So at this point in the book of Mark, Jesus has died, and there are some women and they're coming to Jesus' tomb, and that's where we're picking things up. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and I don't know this word, this name, Salome? Salami? <laughs> it's good meat. They had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. That's Christ. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? You might have thought they would have thought that through beforehand, um, bringing the spices and everything. But regardless, maybe they only knew that it was there when, uh, I don't know. Anyway, they came and they said, who's going to roll this stone away from the door? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. The end. Right? No. What do you mean? Wait a second, there's more text. Verse 9, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene 
out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. We always harp on doubting Thomas, don't we? And yet here we have people believing not the testimony that Christ had risen. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, which they believed, which because, excuse me, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, Amen. <laughs> my, my title of tonight's lesson is The Actual End to Mark's Gospel. And you may think, if you don't hear that correctly, that I'm saying, well, actually, the end is this. No, I'm saying this, what we just read, is the actual end to Mark's Gospel. Don't question, hath God said. It's named that way for a very specific reason, because a very popular preacher who had gone through the New Testament verse by verse for 43 years had a lesson on Mark chapter 16 and the very last lesson saying, these verses 9 through 20 don't belong in your Bible. And to me, because I told you earlier, that is an affront onto the scripture that I believe. Amen. As I told you earlier, it was these verses that helped me come to a knowledge of mid-Acts dispensational right division, and it was these, version, these verses that helped me to come to an, uh, a better understanding of the Bible being God's true word. We'll get to what I mean in just a little bit, but first I want to talk about preservation. Because we talked about how God said things and that we should believe them, but how do we know that what we're reading, the Bible in our hands, is God's Word? Well, God said words, and I think we all would believe that we need to know what they are and, and so that we can use them. And this necessitates a doctrine that each one of us should know about from the Bible, and that is God's preservation. Now, when I say preservation, I mean that the words that you have in your hand, in your Bible, are exactly what God intended without mistake. There's nothing missing. There's nothing that needs to be taken away. What most people mean when they talk about preservation is the science and history of manuscripts, years of studying original languages, textual criticism, that is not what I mean. The Bible's truth doesn't lie in the most ancient and accurate texts. Older doesn't mean accurate or better. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. What's the oldest manuscript you could possibly have? It's the original or a copy of the original, pretty close to when the original was written, right? Well, I know of some old manuscripts in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that Paul talks about, or at least some people talking, and we're going to look at verse 17. Paul testifies that there are people, even in his time, 
He says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Even in Paul's time, there were people corrupting the word of God. So if you had the very first copy, it doesn't mean that it's more accurate. Accuracy doesn't lie within whether or not it's older. Now, what people who, like this other teacher that I mentioned, will claim is that, well, in the oldest manuscripts that we have, which is the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, codexes, they're books before books, but after scrolls. Um, they say, well, those don't contain Mark 9 through 20. So somebody must have added it later. Now, there's an assumption there that if you don't pay attention, you might just accept. But to say something was added later just because it wasn't in a document that may have been penned earlier is not something you can assume. Amen. You can't say that things were added just because we have something written before. Maybe the thing written before doesn't have the things it should have had. Therefore, when I talk about preservation, I'm not talking about these kind of matters. And that's why I said earlier that if you put your trust in the accuracy of Scripture within matters of the science and history of manuscripts, textual criticism, or scholarly studying of ancient languages, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who want to believe the Bible, Amen. who believe they have it in their hand without mistake, who want to grow and understand in understanding of it with one another. Now, if you have something preserved, then you have it. There's no need to reconstruct it. You know what the purpose of textual criticism is? You can look it up. Do a Google. It is to reconstruct the original document because you don't have it based on the copies that you have comparing them with one another to come up with as close as you can to what the original might have said. We already have God's word. If we lost it, it was not preserved. Right. Now, that brings me to point out that if it wasn't preserved, it wasn't God's word. So, Preservation, then, it, it lies in the power of and in the security of God. Preservation is of God, and it is found throughout time by faith in God's Word, which is people reading, using, and copying God's Word. If you need more information on preservation, I would encourage you, since we've already covered it here multiple times, to go back to some of Justin's previous lessons from 2022, uh, you have Biblical Preservation, which was taught on June 5th, 2022. You also have God's Preserved Words, which was taught on November 8th, 2022, which is part 14 in a 15-part series on God's Word given to us. So. We've talked about preservation here, and I won't talk too much more than about it. In fact, I'll stop there. The wrong question then is to ask, hath God said? That's the devil's lie. Is it hard? Is what you're reading in the Bible hard for you to understand? Or does it not make sense to you? Is there something about it that you feel is off? Instead of asking, well, this probably wasn't in the Bible, it was added, or it shouldn't really be there, what I would encourage you to do is to study more, to ask yourself, how could I be wrong? Because as I said earlier, if it's between you or Scripture, it's you. You're the problem. Amen. 
We need to come to the scripture to align ourselves to what it says, trusting it to be the words of God so that ultimately it can affect us. It can produce in us the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom that we need to operate in this present evil, evil world to redeem the time. Now, let's talk a little bit about why this particular teacher doesn't like Mark 9 through 20. So I've got a printout here, several pages long, just to like, like to read you a, a few quotes. Yes, uh, you don't have this in front of you, and yes, I'm picking out certain quotes. So if you'd like to get this full text, you can talk to me afterward. You can look at it for yourself, because again, I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to believe the Bible. And what that ultimately means is you have to study it. You have to understand it. You have to ask yourself if what you hear from my mouth aligns with the Bible. Because if it doesn't, then you need to toss it out. And so what are some problems? Well, obviously, like many, this teacher says that it's the problem of ancient texts, okay? Uh, let's start there. External evidence. How do you know that uh, these verses shouldn't be there? Well, they're not based on the most ancient and accurate texts. In fact, don't you know that if you happen to have a King James Bible or a New King James Bible, you will find verses 9 through 20 in the regular flow of the text without brackets because the King James and the New King James are based on medieval texts. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Is the King James based on medieval texts? Will you accept that statement? I thought the King James was based on the text, God's Word. It's not based on medieval text. It is based on God's word, God's word preserved throughout time by people who made copies of copies. Do we have originals? No. But when we hear arguments against what we know as God's word, or we hear people asking, hath God said, we need to be aware that that's number one, the devil's lie, but also two, if it is the devil's lie, what's the claim and is the claim valid? Now, if you have a New King James or a King James, they are based on medieval texts, a medieval text that's based on later texts. However, since that time, since what time? Since they came out with that translation or that version or whatever you want to call it. Um, since that time, we have discovered that earlier texts, the earlier texts so that all other later translation, translations, the NAS, the updated NAS. Ask me why you need an update. The ESV, the NIV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are all based on the more ancient texts. And you know what the underlying statement there is. Because they're based on those more ancient texts, they are more accurate. So of course, they have brackets around verses 9 through 20, and they call into question whether or not those verses should be in your Bible. Now, I don't want to focus too much on that because really that's not the ballpark that I'm even playing the game in. I care enough to know, but I don't care enough to care. And what I mean is that there's something more, something better, that we need to focus on, and that's what does the Bible say. If we're going to learn about the Bible, we need to compare scriptures with scriptures. And so this teacher gets into that a little bit. The external evidence, as this teacher presents, is the science, the manuscripts, the languages, the textual criticism. But the internal evidence, now we're getting into my arena, and this teacher has some things to say about what the Bible says and comparing verses to verses. Now, 
Verses 9 through 20 shouldn't be there. How, do, how does this person know that? The transition from verse 8 to 9 is awkward. It begins with now. This necessitates continuity with the preceding narrative. However, what follows in verse 9 does not continue the story of the women. Hold on a second. Let's go back there for a second and read it. Uh, Mark chapter 16. Okay. Uh, first verse. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene. All right. Go back to verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. I think that that's continuing the story of these women. It's not an awkward transition. It's continuing the story. Of course, what do I know? I'm just a rube. I don't have the science of manuscripts and 24 units of Greek or Hebrew uh, classes at a seminary. So it's awkward. Why else? It's abrupt. It's a bizarre change. It lacks continuity. He should be continuing the story of the women based on the word now, not jumping to the appearance to Mary Magdalene. He gets into a little bit of uh, pronouns and talks about masculine versus feminine pronouns, which is really, for me, something we can just skip over because we get to better things here a little bit later. The vocabulary is not consistent with Mark. It doesn't even read like Mark. Now, I understand that certain authors have certain things they say, and you can, for instance, in Paul's epistles, he says, and, and every epistle that I write has my token, his signature, right? And there's things that Paul says that he repeats in certain epistles. Yes, writers, authors uh, of the Bible have a style, and yet we know that every word in the Bible is God's. Amen. It's God's word. God is the one who inspired the words that are written down. So... So far, we've got it's odd, it's awkward, it's bizarre, and it doesn't seem to flow. Now, those, to me, are not very strong arguments yet. And, again, the argument is that we should take all these verses out. So, what I like to do, in what I think that we do here often, is to compare Scripture to Scripture to see if it matches. Does what is said here in this part of the book match with what is said over here in this part of the book or that other book. Well, he makes my point for me. After calling things strange and, and bizarre, he says that this is just a hodgepodge of someone who thought the ending of Mark, which should end at, uh, at verse 8, just put together to make it a better ending. Because compared to the other Gospels, Mark is kind of doesn't have that great of an ending. It's just kind of abrupt. And so he says about this hodgepodge of things that, um, well, it's not that they're not true. It's just that they shouldn't be included. For instance, um, it shouldn't be in your Bible, but, well, you know that, that verse that says, uh, verse 9, that's taken from Luke 8, 1. I didn't look that up. That's what he said. 8, 1 to 3. Verse 10, oh, that's taken from John 20. Oh, of, in verse 18. Verse 12 in Mark, chapter 16, that's taken from Luke 24, chapter, or 24 verse 13 to 32. Uh, verse 15, that's taken from Matthew 28, 19. Uh, that's, that go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, that's right out of Matthew 28, 19. Verse 16, taken right out of John 20, 23. Verses 17 and 18, with all the signs and things, they're drawn from a lot of sources in the Bible. Wait a second. You just told me 
that shouldn't be in the Bible, and then you went and proved that everywhere you look, it's in the Bible elsewhere. Amen. I don't understand. I have a problem. The fact is that when you question half God said, and then you actually see that God said it, you're no longer falling prey to a lie. You're becoming a fool. You should know better. Um, and that brings me to a few verses that I'd like to read. Is it hard? Study and consider how you might be wrong so that you can align with what the Bible says. Don't discount God's word. Amen. He said it. He meant it. We have it. Let's use it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, you know, Peter calls what Paul wrote scripture. We covered this on Sunday. But there's an example of when things that are written down are hard, what people do. And uh, it starts in verse 15. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. That sounds exactly like what we're talking about. When we read through Mark, I didn't really point it out because I figured everybody here would get it. There's some hard things in there, right? Drinking deadly things and not dying, um, healing people, uh, speaking in tongues, casting out devils. Those are things that seem kind of hard sometimes to us today because Maybe when we look around and we look at our experience, we don't see that kind of thing happening. And if God's word said that it should happen and it's not happening in my life, then maybe I'm not right. Or maybe God's not right. And then wait a second. That's something that I'm familiar with. Hath God said, oh, that's the lie of the devil. We'll talk about the thing that's going to help you understand God's word and put it in its proper place. But the hard things are not a reason for you to discount the word of God. So what happened in 2 Peter chapter 3? Paul had written, and there are some hard things there. And it says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Now that's not R-E-S-T. Uh, sleep. That's rest, like wrestle. People that are unlearned and unstable rest, wrestle with, as they do also other scriptures to their own, unto their own destruction. We should be able to come to the Bible as God's truth and not wrestle with it, not question, was it supposed to be there? Is it accurate? We should be able to know God promised to preserve his word, Amen. and we have his preserved word in our hands to use, to know, to grow, and to understand and have wisdom in his word. In fact, we're going to read a verse later, I believe, I put it on the outline, about simple-minded folk like me and how God's word is able to make those type of people wise. Let's also take a look at, at uh, 2 Timothy. We talked about 2 Timothy 2.15 earlier, studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman able to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we also talked about this on Sunday. Paul says something about Scripture. Now, you need uh, at least three, four years of Greek in seminary, and you probably are going to need to not only get your master's, but your doctorate in uh, studying the Bible before you're ever going to understand it, right? I don't think so. 
Listen to what Paul said. And Paul, by the way, is speaking the words of God. Listen to what God said. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The only thing you need is God's word. Amen. So is it hard? Yeah, it could be hard. Study, though, and think about how could I be wrong and how can I align myself with God's word? Now, it's hard for this teacher here to reconcile the things that are there, right there in the verses. But also, the complaint was it's odd and it's bizarre. I agree. It's pretty odd and bizarre. In fact, humans don't walk around drinking deadly things and surviving. Uh, they don't heal other people. You know who does do that? God does that. Or God could give people the power to do that. And we're going to talk about the right question in just a moment, which is, what is God doing? But the wrong question is, hath God said? So is it bizarre? It might be. But what you should do is to study and consider ways you might understand better. Don't twist the verses. Don't use them wrongly. That's the devil's lie. Take a look at Revelation chapter 8. This is what helped me understand mid -Act's right division, mid -Act's dispensational right division, and helped me gain faith in the Bible as God's true word. There's no reason to remove verses. Justin pointed out, and I have to uh, give this credit to Justin, that my title of my lesson is the actual end to Mark's gospel. And what I meant by that was the, the actual end, the real end. I didn't mean question whether, or I wasn't going to tell you what the actual end was, which was my kind of double entendre there. And Justin pointed out, maybe this is a triple entendre. Because the actual end to Mark 16 is right here in Revelation chapter 8. Let's take a look. Were those verses 9 through 20 just right there, the end? Well, I think they're the end of Mark, but uh, the book of Mark, but the things that that describes are found here in Revelation. Revelation chapter 8, starting in verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Take a look at Revelation chapter 16. In verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. I'm sorry, I should have started in verse 4. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And then in verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints of the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Starting in verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. 
Mark 16 had some really bizarre stuff in it, and quite frankly, so does Revelation. Kind of bizarre. And yet, all of a sudden, I'm making a connection between Mark chapter 16 and Revelation. Would if a third part of the waters were wormwood or blood and I had to drink them, would it be valuable for me to drink any deadly thing and survive? Yes. I think it would. Yes. And if there were these terrifying monsters with tails like serpents, would it be good for me to be able to handle serpents and not be harmed? I think it would. No. That connection was back in 2005, I think, is when that connection was made for me. I wasn't studying on my own. As I said, I'm no scholar. In fact, don't listen to me. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. However, when I compare Scripture to Scripture and I find these types of connections, it makes me want to believe that Scripture because it's ringing true. Amen. It's saying what it says, and I can let it say what it says without trying to remove it or use it wrongly. So the wrong question is, hath God said? But what's the right question? The right question is, what is God doing? Because, as I mentioned earlier, I look around, and if I try to pick up a serpent, I'll probably get bitten and die. If I try to go home and drink some Drano, I'm going to be in the hospital yep. or die. I don't have what God, Jesus, seemingly said was going to happen for those folks that believe, said the signs would follow. I don't have those signs. Why? Well, I tried to hint at this earlier. You know, people can't do those things. God can. And the question is, what is God doing? That's the question that's right. Not, did God say? What is God doing? God spoke. We have his word. It's preserved for us today. What God said differs in the time that he said it, in the audience to whom he spoke it, in the context in which it was said, and in the instructions therein. Amen. Instead of asking, hath God said, let's let God's word stand. Yes. God does not change. That's true. But you know what does change? His instructions. His instructions do change. We know that. We can read the Bible and see where his instructions change. On Sunday, I joked, should I take two coats or one coat? How many scripts? Should I take my purse with me for my journey or should I not? Those are both instructions to, that Christ gave to his disciples as they went around Israel and preached the gospel of the kingdom. Which one is it? Which one is God doing? I joked also, should I beat my sword into a plowshare or my plowshare into a sword? You know, God gave Israel both of those instructions, yes. and they were instructions for different times. Amen. Different times. God does things in time. And what is God doing today? Is God sending wrath and punishment for sin upon the earth, poisoning or making a third part of the waters unable to drink? No. Have you seen the crazy serpent-tailed monsters running around recently? I haven't. Very bizarre, yes, but the Bible says it, so God wasn't lying, but he's not doing that currently. So I don't need the signs that follow so that I can operate in that time that's not the time that I'm in. So come to the Bible understanding that God does not change, but what he's doing does and what he wants us to do does. Take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1, Paul says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them 
which believe and know the truth. And I'll read the next verse. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. There was a time at which God told a specific group of people that they could only marry certain people. For instance, that people was Israel and the people that they could marry were other Israelites. They were not to marry outside of the nation. That According to Paul, that forbidding to marry is a doctrine of devils today. God said something in the past to an audience in a context at a time. And that same thing that God said, if I were to tell you today that same instruction, I would be participating in the devil's lie. I would be using scripture incorrectly. Instead, I should properly identify that as a doctrine of devils. Abstaining from meats, I'm sure you're all familiar. In fact, so much of our food these days goes through a process to ensure that it is kosher. It's a very big business to get the little, I think it's a little U symbol. If you look at any of your food, most, most all of your food has this little U symbol. And what that means is it's kosher. It's approved to be eaten under supposedly God's law for what you can and cannot eat. However, you know, forbidding to eat or abstaining from meats today, if I were to teach that to you, would be wrong. Yes. That's an instruction God gave to a different people at a different time, and it's in the Bible. God said it. It's true. But we also have to realize that what God said comes with a context. We have to connect what God said, and we have to ask, what is God doing Come to the Bible with faith that, is, that it is without mistake and you're a final authority. It means what it says. In Titus chapter 1, let's take a look there. This is Paul giving instructions to Titus about the ministry that's being done. In verse 9, Paul says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. We're going to skip over to chapter 2, verse 1. But speaketh thou the things which become sound doctrine. And in verse 15 in chapter 2, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The things that we should be doing today are these things, speaking God's word, yeah. speaking sound doctrine, Amen. speaking not only discounting God's word, avoiding that lie of the devil, but also avoiding using God's word incorrectly. We need to speak it. We need to speak it accurately. We have it. We need to understand God's word in its context. And the only way you're going to do that is if you recognize Paul's apostleship. Because it was Paul that was given the dispensation of grace. It was to Paul to whom God revealed the mystery of Christ and the gospel of Christ, preached according to the mystery. And that is what God is doing today. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 7, Paul says, Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. We'll just leave with this final thought here, and it comes from Psalm. Psalm 19. In verse 7 of Psalm 19, we read, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I would encourage you and I would encourage others who may care to listen, although I don't know why you would. Um, I'm nobody, don't believe me, but I would encourage you to believe the testimony of the Lord. So I think that's where we'll end it tonight. Are there any comments or questions?